Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the third video in the restoration of the Sony CRF320. The one that's really going to leave me completely bald. I have got some progress to report. I've got some frustration to report. So um, in the middle of all this, I went uh, a little bit tangential in my process. I decided to do some things that I know that I can do and uh, let the unknowns sort of filter into the brain and see if the brain decides to pop up any solutions. Also, I want to thank all of you who contributed, who answered my plea for uh, high-res schematics. I've got some incredible schematics from you, very high resolution, fully defined. I can see everything, which actually just raised a few more doubts because some of the things that I measured on here seem to be correct, but they don't correspond to what the schematic tells me I should expect. This is the problem with some of these schematics. Unless somebody has reported errors on the schematics, I don't know whether it's the schematic that's wrong, whether it's the radio that's wrong, whether somebody who tampered with this connected things the wrong way, the doubts are still there. And I've actually asked someone who's worked on these before for help. I'm waiting for him to have a look at this video, which may show him what the symptoms are, and perhaps he can help me uh, go take this the, to the final step. And I'm going to do that. It's just taking a lot, a lot longer than I expected. The other thing that I want to show you here is I went and worked on that gear for the shortwave. When I opened this thing up, the gear was completely messed up. It really needed replacement and I decided to give it a try with the 3D printing and I've got, I'm happy to report, it works. And at the end, I will show you how I designed it in Fusion 360, which by the way, somebody raised it this week. The Fusion 360 version that I'm using is free. There are certain limitations, but they haven't really been in effect, affected me at all so far. So I'm using the free version. It's got an amazing gear designing plugin. And that's what I'm using. And at the end of the video, I'll show you exactly how I did that. If you're interested, you can do it yourself. One other thing, if you want those STL files, the Fusion 360 files or the actual STL files, I will send it to anybody who emails me and asks for it. I'm not going to post it to any production website because this week has been interesting in another for another reason. Somebody has painted me with their palette. Somebody who obviously sees frauds and crime in everything has accused me of being an absolute mercenary, totally fraudulent, going to name and shame me. And that really bothers me, as you can tell. So I'm going to send this to whoever asks and ask you to order these things, produce these things at your own risk. I thought that we were an adult society, an adult community, that we wouldn't need to put these warnings about hot coffee everywhere, but maybe I was wrong. Anyway, if this sort of thing turns you on, stick around, enjoy the video. I focused my attention on here since I've replaced some of those capacitors. What I've got here is still 10.9 now. I think one of the reasons is I had the uh, ground of the meter connected just to the chassis over here. And if there is a bit of resistance in between on the chassis itself, that would uh, create a voltage drop. I've got it now right at the input there. So that might have been my stupid problem all along. 10.9, that to me is 11 volts. 4.84 and 6.3. No problem at all there. And then what I've got is I've got um, just checking voltages going to the different places. That is a, that's 4.8 over there. So that board's getting the five volts. That's a signal. That's a signal. I'm just checking to see if there's anything else it should be getting. And I've got my five kilohertz over here. If I put that there, so there's my 5.00 kilohertz. So that is fine. I then went and looked further along the synthesizer board because there are other signals coming out of here. And what have I got here? Well, let's see. What is that? That is 3.1 megahertz. Now, what happens if I tune it? So that is tuning between 2.4 and 3.4. That is that signal that this thing is supposed to be producing, and it seems to be okay. There is some artifact on top of that. I'm not sure what that is, but I don't know what it's supposed to look like. There's another signal line over here. What is that? That is 45.6. Now, I think 
this thing is moving around. Don't worry about that. Okay. It's just not very solidly connected there. Let's see what happens if I tune. That stays perfectly still. And that's what I expect from the um, output of, I believe it's the first mixer. It actually converts everything up to 45 point something. 45.6. I can't really rely too much on that um, on that frequency counting there. But that seems to be okay there. So now I need to have a look at the... I'm going to look at the front. I've got to take that um, the tuning dial out because that thing is... Oh, it's suspicious. Let me take it out and show you what I find. I want to show you something that happened rather unexpectedly. Look at that. You remember this guy was flicking away? Now it is fine. This one's always been fine. It's been going from, you know, zero to nine. This one was sort of flicking away like crazy. And what happened was I bumped this socket at the top here and I realized there must be something to do with the uh, switching. This is the meter board and where all the switching of the, um, of the various bands comes in. You get three that go from well, there's zero, there's the 10 megahertz and the 20 megahertz. And then the um, this one goes from zero to nine megahertz. And then that is tuned with the actual tuning section. Now, something else happened, which was even more surprising. And that is, I've now got something. You see, I can now peak the antenna. on some of the bands. Let me try and tune it. I'll talk about this in a second. Let's see if I can get something up here. It doesn't work on all of them. See, that's doing nothing. I can peak that one. And of course, when I manage to peak it, it means the thing is working properly and I can play with the RF gain. Okay, let's see if I pick up anything. Ah, see that? And that has sort of told me where the problem is. I think the problem is in the switching of these guys. Now, what this does uh, I, I had to read the, the whole description of the schematic and one of the circuit, uh, one of the service manuals actually had that at the end, the entire description on how this front end works. The uh, signal coming in is converted to 45 point, what is it, 45.6 megahertz, and then up, uh, then it's amplified and then it's uh, mixed again to 455. Now, what happens is this switching system brings in a number of coils and tuning diodes, capacitor diodes, to allow you to vary the frequency because it's going to vary between uh, 2.455 and 3.455 megahertz. So there's a one megahertz range, which is the one that you tune here. These guys, you sort of step up or down depending on where you want to tune to. And what I've found is some of them some of the steps work, like this one, and some of them don't. Let's see. That's nothing. I can, I can tell right away, whenever I tune to a band, if I play with the RF gain and I hear nothing, I know it's not going to do it on that band, on that megahertz range. See, that one's doing it. That's working. Let's see, this is uh, upper sideband. So I've got some of it working and I think the answer lies in that switching board over there. But let me go down to what I wanted to describe here. 
This thing came out quite easy. It comes out as is to be expected. You remove this plate out first, and then you remove this, and then the whole thing gets uh, messed up. So then you have to follow Mr. Carlson's description on how to put everything back together. And it looks like these guys are OK. It's all gunged up with grease, but it seems to all be fine. OK, that in there seems to be fine. Now watch this. <laughs> Look at this guy. This isn't cracked. This thing is completely messed up. This gear is not just cracked. It's just about to fall apart. And I was feeling bumps as I tuned in here. So this one obviously needs to be replaced as well. So I'm going to have to design it because I couldn't find an STL file for this, a print file for this. Um, so I'm going to have to design it. It shouldn't be too difficult. I've just figured out how to use the gear tool in, um, in Fusion 360. But yeah, this is definitely a no-go. And everything else seems to be OK. There's a little bit of grunge and dirt that I need to clean from here. But nothing serious. I can then put this whole thing together again. That comes out. Everything is unstuck. I'll then need to use a bit of glue later on. Just want to put this thing together more or less so I know how it goes. And we put that aside because right now I'm curious about this little issue. I'm going to have to follow. What happens here is as you switch in these guys, you end up with 29, I think it's 29 different steps of tuning. And it switches in using transistors. There's a selector section where um, it switches in certain coils that become part of the of the tuning uh, tank circuit that is used to tune uh, your your front end. And if some of those coils aren't coming in, then that band just sounds dead because this thing then gets divided and it gets fed to the PLL and then the PLL corrects the frequency using the VFO, which is extremely accurate. And I believe we I'm quite confident that that part is working now. So I think my next challenge is going to be up here. And this up here is quite challenging because to get this out, you've got to remove most of the back out. I'm actually going to see whether, you know, I found one problem, two problems with these plugs already. So what I'm going to do, I know which voltages I'm supposed to see at different pins here for different ranges. And I think what I'm going to do is check whether those voltages are there. That might be the smartest way to, to go about this. But I'm so happy that we can actually hear something, albeit not on all bands. See, that one's completely dead. That would work if we had anything up at this level. OK, that's hinted where I should go. And I've got to think about designing that gear because I actually think that if I can get that sorted, in fact, I think that I can finish this before I actually open the top. I'm not sure. Right, one more step in the right direction, I hope. When I was a kid and my mom wanted me to help her clean the house, she actually said that um, I should look at it as therapeutic. I thought she was full of it, but um, I'm stuck with this one problem. So I've decided to just move away from it for a while and do what I know that I can do. And that is to restore, rebuild this section. And hoping that my mother was not really full of it, I've gone and started cleaning these parts because there's a lot of old glue and grunge on there. And of course, all these had to be degreased. There was a lot of grease on here. This uh, gear or this is this section is perfectly OK. So I don't have the issue that uh, Mr. Carlson had with a cracked plastic um, extension on here. These have been completely cleaned. And they are now ready to go into it. As you'll notice, this gear has got no spring on there because this thing jumped out. And between this one and that one, actually between this one and this one, this little spring 
jumped out about four times, and every time I was able to find it, which means luck was on my side. But I decided to give it a break last night because I didn't want to push my luck. And when I'm trying to adjust this thing, at least I'll have a working dial, which will make it easier for me to try and figure out the issue. I may have to remove it all later again, who knows. But anyway, it'll make me feel better and it'll be therapeutic. Here it is, folks. The gear that I designed and printed. And surprisingly enough, it actually fitted on the first try. What I did do wrong is I actually made on the first attempt, the teeth were a little bit too short. And so was that back thing there. So I just adjusted the sizes. And I think this is going to work. I'll show you how I designed this a little bit later. I think it's going to work. Now let me try and put this whole front back in there and see how we get on. So here we have it. It looks like this thing is more or less well aligned. It's on the thousand and now I've noticed this thing here has lost a digit, which I've got to look into. This uh, counterboard, I think, is the one that's giving me all the problems. There's a switch in there as well, so yeah. So we go across here. There's 850 straight on. This is the little line of there, over there, which we cannot see, but it's uh, scoured into the aluminium. Carry on, carry on. Go all the way back to zero. There we go. And of course it goes a bit beyond, but the plastic uh, gear at the top, at the back stops it. So it looks like my little gear is going to work. It's working. What I've got to do is, I'm leaving this loose for now, I've got to put a dab of glue on here because this uh, middle ring, the ring, uh, the middle brass ring was, um, came unstuck. I had to loosen it because you have to do that to adjust the dial. And it, I think it'll move. So when I'm finally satisfied with this whole section, I'll remove this again, just give it a dab of glue just to make sure it stays there. That's what they did initially. And uh, if it's good for them, it's good for me. My problem still persists though. Here's an example. I'm now receiving something. The antenna tuner works on this one. So it is receiving there. If I try 13 megahertz. It might actually be receiving, I'm not sure. 12. Let's try 9. Just want to see where I'm getting something. See, that has no effect. Huh. I don't think that's having an effect either. That seems to be making some noise. Let's go to where I was. 14, I think it was. Okay, so for example here it's receiving, let's call it perfectly for now. Everything works. The Obviously the audio works, but the, um, the RF gain is working. Noise blank, I'm not sure. The antenna tuning is working. So you'd think that it's all okay, but then the minute you change to say 13, or 12, which is more where I'd, ex I'd expect to find something at this time of night. Let's try here. Got the volume on max. Maybe we'll get something here. That's Definitely not normal. Twelve, nothing. Let's try fifteen. When the antenna tuner has no effect, I know it's not going to do anything.
this time of night there should be something on here on the um, amateur band I'm picking up nothing oh maybe I am In fact, let's try something. That's on 14.3 megahertz. I'm going to connect this instead of the antenna. I'm going to connect it to the signal generator. I'm going to give it, what is it, 14.3 with a tone. Nothing. Sometimes I get it one megahertz below or above. But you see, I'm getting nothing. So it wasn't. I wasn't receiving 14, I don't think. Okay. Signal generator is producing 12.3. I'm receiving it on 13.3. Now, if I take that 12.3 and make it 11.3, I sometimes receive it on here. No, nope. let's go up. Signal generators on 13.3. I get nothing on here. If I go to 14.3, there it is. Let's go to 15.3, see if there's anything. And I change the signal to 14.3. Nothing. Signal generator at 15. There it is. Let's go up another one. Signal generator is now at 16. And this one's just skipping. I'm not even going to try. It's at 10.3. Let's see. Yep, I'm producing 9.3. It's seeing it at 10.3. I'm dropping the signal. It's not even latching properly. This is so frustrating. Now, let me go down, 7.3, 8.3, 7.3, 6.3, if I put the signal generator at 5.3, yeah. Signal generator is at 5.3, I'm getting at 6.3. So you see the, the pattern? So that is my issue, and believe it or not, uh, yesterday morning when I got up, I did this test 1.6 or no, I did it at 1.8 all the way to 29.8 and all the channels worked and it had the correct readout. Corresponded perfectly with, actually I didn't go to 29.8, I went to 19.8 because my signal generator doesn't go above 20 and everyone worked and it was exactly right and now that LED's come back. See that? This is Bad connections, bad soldering, bad tampering. I've got a feeling that it could possibly be these um, switches in here, which I can't really get into without removing it. But what I've also done is I've gone through the schematic and there are parts there where they tell you at certain frequency ranges what voltages you should get here. There are three voltages that you can test for. You've got to get 11, 6.3 and 4.8. Now what I've done is I've tested all the 11s, all the 6.3s, and all the 4.8s, and they seem to be about right with the exception of the first range. At um, that first range, there's one position here which should only be high at 4.8 on 1, 3, 7, 9, I think it is. I'll show you. There's a connector down there which corresponds to connections that come up to here. It's... Um, the megahertz switch, you should get 4.8 at these particular connector points, which are correspond to some of these wires at different uh, frequency ranges. And for example, 
Uh, pin 60 or the connection 60 on the schematic says I should get a high of 4.8 at 1379. I get it at all that, plus I get it on 5. On these guys, this one here, I get it all correct. 62, I get these correct. All these are correct with the exception of the, the first one. And I've actually looked at the switch and from the way the switch is configured, I think it should give me 5. So again, I'm not sure whether there's an error in the schematic or not, which is just absolutely driving me up the wall. And I've checked some capacitors, made sure that the capacitors are fine. What else? What else? I've followed the signal on the noise blank. I've noticed that um, when the, when the uh, system is responding, in other words, when I can tune the, um, the, the antenna, transistor 231 is giving me a different voltage. It's switching on and off. Uh, when it's uh, giving me a noise, it's switched on or is it off? And when it's not, it's switched on. I followed that all the way to the, the ICs, the bottom of the board. Still no joy. I still can't figure out what it is. Now, admittedly, this has been a holiday weekend or week and um, probably a little bit too much consumption of all sorts of stuff. And maybe my brain isn't working as clearly as it should. Nevertheless, I'm getting there one step at a time, <laughs> one task at a time. If I can't get that shortwave to work, then this will be the cleanest non-working shortwave receiver you've ever seen. So what I've done is I've asked someone for help, someone who's worked on one of these, and uh, he has kindly said he'll happily look at it. Part of um, what he needs is what I'm showing you in this video, showing him, showing you and him what it is that I've got, and perhaps he can come up with some ideas. Nevertheless, let me show you how, the, um, how I designed that gear. That I can certainly do. By the way, the gear has now... By the way, the gear now has finally kicked the bucket. It's in two pieces. Fortunately, this one seems to be working very well. All right. Right, here's my finished gear. This is the one that I printed out last after making a couple of adjustments. And I'm going to reproduce it from scratch to show you how it's done. Now, let's look at some of the measurements first. The diameter of the gear that I measured was 56.7 millimeters. I've given this one 57. The inner diameter here was 33 millimeters. And when I printed the first one, it was just a little bit too tight. So I've given it 33.2. The number of teeth I counted one by one a few times, it's 72 teeth. And the outer diameter to that point there, not that one, but that one around there, which I was able to measure with the calipers, was 37 millimeters. Furthermore, the ideal height for this gear was 6.2 millimeters. I'd originally done it at uh, five and it was too short. I had to redo it. So 6.2 millimeter height. The thickness of this was one millimeter. And if we look on the underside, we've got that lip that comes down. It is 4.5 millimeters high from there to there, that height. It's one millimeter wide. The inner diameter is 48.5 and this outer diameter is 50.5 millimeters. So with those measurements, we can now start our new gear, which is exactly what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to start a new project or new design and I'm going to save it. I'm going to call it gear two. And now I'm going to activate the spur gear function, which comes built into this Fusion 360. Now this is the free version. There's a limit to the editable, editable, editable documents you can have. I think it's 10. So this is telling me that it's reached my limit. If I want to edit a new one, I've got to make some of the others uneditable and start again, but you can go backwards and forwards. So it's not a limitation. So let's go to the gear function. The way to do that, is you choose utilities over here and you've got add-ins. So this is a plugin that they provided and it's got one here called Spur Gear. That's the one I use. I'm just going to double click it and this thing comes up here and it tells us quite a few things and I can put in quite a few things straight away. Metric, I leave it as metric. 20 degrees is that angle there. I left it at 20 degrees. Number of teeth was 72. Gear thickness was 6.2 millimeters. I'm putting in what I know. Hole diameter, I'm leaving it as zero because I wanted this to be editable at the end. In other words, I'm going to extrude that rather than leave it in the actual gear module. And what this does, you see, I've got here a pitch diameter and 
the module is the size ratio. So it's pitch diameter divided by number of teeth. Now I've got 72 teeth. If I make this 0.5, it tells me that 36 millimeters will be the pitch diameter, will be that diameter there. Now I know that my gear is 37, but I think this is on purpose. I think if I do that, it'll give me 37 on the outside and I can tell you it does, but this is how my logic went when I was doing this. Now it does tell me here that um, the root fillet radius is too large, it must be less than 0.29. So that's the root fillet, fillet radius, it's got to do with the radius in there. Obviously if you've got a number of teeth and you've got a certain ratio of, um, or a certain diameter, you can't just put any radius you want there or the gear will just go like that. So it says 0.29, I'm going to put it at 0.25. What I've got now is, I've not changed that, not changed that. I've got 0.5 module, 72 teeth. I don't even know what backlash is. Didn't bother. Root radius 0.25. Gear thickness 6.2 millimeters. I can make this whatever I want, but I'm leaving it at uh, the 6.2, which I know is now correct. And I go, okay. And it's produced that. That is my gear. And I can check certain things. I can check, for example, the heights. If I do that and I look down here, I've got 6.2, that's fine. I want to check that radius, the final radius of 37. But to do that, I'm actually going to make a sketch on here to punch the hole through. In fact, what I can do is not punch the hole through. I can make that outer diameter thingy as well. So let me do that. I go back to solid. I'm going to create a sketch and I'll sketch it on this surface. And while we're here, we can see whether that diameter is 37. So I can choose a circle here. Go to the center there, go out. And when I get to there, I've got 37. Perfect. Perfect. So now I'm going to create that outer diameter, which is 56.7 and I gave it 57. So I'm going to give it 57. Fine. I'm going to extrude that one millimeter, which is the thickness of that base. But what I need to extrude is not just that, it's the whole thing. So I choose that as well. And I'm going up one millimeter. And there we have it. So I've got my gear at the bottom and I've got my base at the top. I can now come here and I can make the, uh, the hole in the middle. So I'm going to do another sketch on the surface. And I'm going to make a hole which is, it said 33, I gave it 33.2 because my first attempt didn't fit perfectly. Now I'm going to extrude that and I'm going to extrude all the way through down. So I'll give it the direction and I'll go to this point here and I'll say all and that's made my hole. Perfect. Looking good so far. Now I need to make that lip on the inside. So I turn it around here and I'm going to do another sketch on this surface. And that is a 48.5 millimeter radius, 48.5. And I'm going to give it a thickness of one. It's already one, so I just hit it. Now I'm going to extrude that section there. I'm going to extrude it down 4.5 millimeters. And that I think, let me just check everything. That's my gear. Now I can export this as an STL file, which is going to go, it's going to be ready to either post up to any, any company that's doing uh, 3D printing online, or you can use it on your slicer. So I'm going to go here to File, Export, and I'll choose STL and that's my gear 2 version 1 to the desktop and I'll just export it and very soon we will have that on the desktop. It takes a bit of time to export because these teeth are a lot of detail. If you want these uh, STL files, both this one and the one for the small gear, just uh, contact me and I'll send it to you. I'm not going to post it. I'll email it to anybody who asks but I am not going to post it on any, um, any website or any service because some strange things have happened this week with some of the recommendations that I made. I was accused of all sorts of stuff and 
I, I got, I've got to be quite frank. I, I just can't understand how some people pick on things uh, that um, the minute it's anything to do with their responsibility, they find a, a scapegoat. And somebody tried to make me the scapegoat. Fortunately for me, I couldn't give a damn. Uh, I don't take that sort of thing seriously. I just uh, shrug it off. But it just goes to show that there's different strokes for different folks. Somebody will always find that um, whatever you do is for self-interest and they'll try and paint it under their palette. So that's what's happened. Anyway, if you want this, contact me. I'll send it to you. Okay, that's it. And that is where we are right now. In a little bit of a stalemate, I keep doing things that I can. I'm uh, looking at uh, an inevitability of uh, dismantling that whole counter, frequency counter board at the top there. But I'm just going to wait for my friend to have a look at this video and give me his opinion if he can, so that I don't delve into stuff that I don't need to. I've seen too many instances where you fiddle with what you shouldn't. And obviously somebody has done that a lot on this radio. I'm not accusing them of incompetence, but probably a frustration that ended with him putting things together, sort of just to get out of it, just to get rid of the project, because that's what it looks like. A lot of these things were put back in a hurry, and that's caused me an endless amount of uh, searching and frustration. I don't want to do the same. I want to finish this. I want to get this done. So that's where I'm going to leave you for now, for today, for this video and for this year. And in the meantime, if you have any ideas or comments to make, please go ahead and do so below. And um, I will see you next year. So once again, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do so on Patreon and PayPal. Bye for now. Stay safe and have a happy new year.